APIs as at January 2021. So at number five, we've got uh, firing platform events from Batch Apex. Uh, this is essentially a feature, and I've included links at the top of each of these for further reference. But this feature is essentially ability to capture errors that are emitted from a batch apex, whether it's in the start or in the execute or in the finish phase of a batch apex job. All you need to do is implement this interface. It doesn't actually have any methods and that'll trigger the platform to know that you want to receive or somebody wants to receive those events whenever any errors um, occur from either of these uh, methods. And that also includes unhandled uh, exceptions such as those uh, relating to limits and such like. So uh, this sample code is uh, processing some orders and uh, creating some invoices. And we've got a rather evil looking method here that attempts to create some uh, exceptions, including some unhandled exceptions, such as those around limits. So uh, this job executes and when errors occur, this platform event fires. This is the batch apex error events and it's a standard platform event so it's not a custom one you have to create and this is my handler for it um, it's pretty much derived from the documentation um, the documentation queries the async apex job the batch apex class it does that so that it only processes events for the one that we're interested in which is that batch job we were just looking at and it simply in this case updates the originating order records with um, the appropriate acceptance type and message so that an end user or an admin can go and review those and rectify any problems. Of course, you can do all sorts of things in this handler um, since it's Apex. Uh, you can also subscribe to this event using uh, Flow as well and Process Builder. So uh, it's good for those kind of um, declarative subscriptions. Number four is uh, the request class. It's a relatively new feature, but it has a couple of things that I'm going to cover in, the, in four and um, three. Uh, the first one is uh, the request ID, and again here are the links uh, as well as some um, additional information uh, and uh, how it relates to event logs, for example. So it's pretty simple to use, get recurrent and then call get request ID gives you the request ID. It's the same request ID we use in the event logs product, uh, event logs products and also um, you'll see in debug logs. Um, from an Apex point of view, it's also pretty useful to correlate asynchronous processing. So this example, I imagine you've got a Lightning Web component, it's an aura-enabled event uh, method here, and you're creating custom metadata as a native API for doing so. And it's asynchronously implemented, so you enqueue that deployment. The callback can use the request ID as a kind of correlation ID, so the client knows that the response from the callback is specifically for this piece of work and not anything else being done by another user or another request. So we store the correlation ID in our handler, which is simply an implementation of the metadata deploy callback. And inside that, I've not obviously completed the logic here, but you can go and invoke um, uh, some, store some of that callback information in a custom object, or if you wanted to, you could fire an event and of course passing the correlation ID forward in that event allows any subscribers to determine whether it's an event applicable to them or anybody else. So interesting use of the request ID as a correlation ID, both in terms of uh, asynchronous processing, but also in those event logs and in the debug logs, you'll be getting a much more cons uh, kind of um, uh, overall view of what the processing is, is, is under, undertaking on the platform, both your code and any events that are being captured by the event log uh, system. So that was number four. Number three is again using this request uh, class, but this time using liquidity um, uh, value, which tells us when, uh, what type of uh, request is invoking the Apex code. That might be a, a lightning component action. It might be some visual force code. It might be a scheduled job, might be batch Apex. There's quite a number of places, as many of you know, that can be invoked from Apex, that can invoke Apex rather. So how could we make the use of this in a use case? Well, imagine we've got this piece of code here, it's processing some new orders, and it's in an Apex trigger. And Apex triggers uh, generally are, um, by design, unaware of the context in which they're used, but in some cases, it is helpful to know whether you're in a bulk API load situation or whether you're in an asynchronous situation, or even if you are in a trigger situation for some shared logic, 
when you can actually do certain operations which are sometimes blocked due to limits. So um, we want to try and keep this code fairly sane looking, but avoid all sort of if-then-else logic when we're comparing the value of quiddity to know what context we're in. So this pattern breaks down the, the logic into a basic abstract class that represents field value setting on the orders. Maybe we're generating some invoices and maybe we're calling an external system to pass back that ID and Salesforce that represents the order. And this might look like this might be an example of such implementation where you're setting some default values, generating those invoices from a batch of orders, or even updating um, an external system with some callouts. Now, given the number of contexts I just listed there, if we were in a bulk API situation, we may want to choose to defer some of the heavy duty processing, such as generating orders or even some callbacks to an external system until a later date, maybe an asynchronous scheduled job might handle these post-process. So this particular class extends that base ordering class and does bulk API processing and customizes that logic effectively. Likewise, inside the trigger scenario, this trigger processing, order processing class extends the base order one and overrides the generate invoice and update external order management system with appropriate logic that you'd see it based on a trigger context. So how does all this work? Because that logic that I looked at earlier didn't appear to know anything about those contexts. And that was the design, the idea. We want to make sure this is kind of agnostic of those contexts. So the order processor property is kind of the thing that does the magic. If we scroll down to the bottom of this class, we can see that the order, um, it is actually a, a property, a static property. And the getter for that is resolved by using this quiddity value. And then there's a switch statement that says, well, if I'm in synchronous, which is a trigger mode, then I'll use the trigger implementation, this one for bulk, and of course, if there's any other context that we're not particularly uh, concerned with customizing, then we'll just use the base order processing. So this is kind of a, a neat way of kind of keeping your code fairly sane, making it extensible um, for different contexts if you need to uh, modify your code for different scenarios and different uh, use cases. So that also um, gives us the ability to emulate some of those environments because since we can inject the uh, quiddity uh, value into the context of that class for testing purposes, it means that we can, for example, emulate the bulk API logic that we just looked at without actually having to um, think about how we can emulate the bulk API itself. So it's kind of a unit test for bulk API related logic, which is pretty neat. So uh, number two, number two, relates to notifications uh, sharing to the end user. This is a relatively new feature and now has an Apex API. So we're gonna go and create an order as part of this demo. It's a special order. We want to notify users that it's arrived and you know make some, some kind of uh, noise about that because it's a particular uh, order of a significant value, for example. Um, so this sample code creates that order and creates this uh, custom notification type and then eventually sends it using notification.send and we're using some metadata that was created earlier um, under the setup menu called notification types. So I can go ahead and run this uh, sample code by just uh, executing this snippet of uh, Apex code in the comment here. And then if we go to the uh, window with my org open, I can see the bell icon, which is where my notifications arrives, has that notification in it. If I was on a mobile device, um, this would show on my device notifications. Uh, you know, if it was an Apple device, for example, um, other mobiles are available. If mobile devices are available, then I would see the notification on the lock screen. So that's pretty cool because as an Apex developer, I don't really need to know too much about mobile notifications or anything really. I can just use this Apex code and it will send those notifications. As you can just see here, they're, they're um, context aware as well, which is pretty cool. So I was able to click on that notification and it would take me directly to the order. Uh, so that's a great feature uh, available and that's number two. So number one, I've chosen to go with um, the ability to be more dynamic about how you raise errors on S objects. So for those of you familiar writing triggers or even um, other parts of, um, of Salesforce, maybe Visual Force pages or even Lightning components, you can set errors on the S object fields or on the S object and those filter through into the various user interfaces. Um, historically, you've had to be very specific about the field that you need to set. 
and you've also it's also been hard to get the errors back out when you want to write tests unless you need to insert those records which is expensive if you're writing a lot of tests for different scenarios so the enhancement that's been made here is first of all we can use a dynamic or in this case literal string we don't have to use the actual hard-coded value which you'll see why in a moment that's quite useful for writing like library functions around error handling and secondly I can get hold of those errors um, dynamically from that S object type just directly from the opportunity that I just created here I didn't need to insert that opportunity or even set any other values on it so it, ke it keeps it really lean from a unit testing perspective and you can see like these asserts run here and that I'll just run that just to prove that logic's working so it's a very basic demo of that didn't throw any particular errors in, in the console there so um, if we were to look at how we typically do error handling in the past you can see that when I'm setting errors um, like the add error here I'm being very specific about setting it on the description field there's a whole bunch load of logic here around querying related accounts comparing the old and new values um, it's very hard to actually see the validation amongst some of the kind of boilerplate code that we typically have to write. Now, there is a library that's linked to in the in the in the links at the top of this uh, particular um, demo here, uh, which is an S object field validator. It's an open source library, but the idea is it kind of proves that with the advent of this dynamic ability to add errors, you can create libraries that really cut down on some of this boilerplate code and allow you to focus on writing uh, the, the actual validation logic itself. So this is kind of a bit of an experiment in how you could write um, kind of like a generic field validator library. Uh, but nonetheless, it demonstrates um, kind of the ability um, that, that dynamically adding field uh, errors offers, um, as obviously you've got this uh, testing capability as well. So that is um, essentially um, all of my top five, but I have been asked to provide a bonus um, item as well. So this is my bonus item. And for that, I've chosen to use transaction finalizers. It's in pilot at the moment. Um, we'll be going into beta in the summer, in the spring release, rather. Um, and the idea with this is that if you're, again, using asynchronous processing, you want to know more about the outcome of that, if it's errored, or even if it was successful, or even do some more logging capabilities. And while it's been possible to do that today, it's always been difficult to do that, particularly if there's unhandled exceptions, or you needed to roll back some transactions and yet still log some output. So finalizers basically run regardless whether your queuable failed or succeeded and you get to specify the code that executes in that situation. So I've emulated two jobs here, a job that starts um, called job one, I give it a workload, it's a very simple demo here, just give it the value of 10 and the second job is a value of 201 and that, go that goes on to control in the job itself what uh, work is undertaken. So I'm just using it, I'm just playing a kind of a little evil bit of code here that uh, obviously is not bulkified, but I'm trying to tease out the unhandled exceptions behavior of this feature. So the key bit of logic here is this finalizer, system.attach finalizer. When you do that, this piece of code that's inside this, this class here will get executed when this completes, regardless of whether an error occurs or not. I'm also using it to capture some state, like error mes uh, some log messages, so I can get those output as well. And these are obviously get captured regardless of whether an error occurs because they're, ca they're kind of stored in memory right now. So let's have a look at that bonus finalizer. And um, you can see that, um, first of all, it checks whether or not the result of the queuable was success or failure and then adds an appropriate message. And then I'm using that notification technique I showed you earlier to send a notification to the UI or the mobile device. You could of course log, and there's a great example in the docs of how to log this to a custom object if you wanted to, or even send a platform event. So let's just quickly go ahead and run this example. Um, it's also worth wanting to point out there's a really cool example for those of you familiar with Node.js around promises. Um, this is a way of kind of chaining asynchronous processes together in an effective and reliable way. It's worth checking out the link there. Uh, talks more in depth about how to use this feature in that context. So now we can see the two notifications have appeared. Here's the one that failed. We got our limit exception. So it proved that the logic was actually able to capture unhandled, uh, up until now at least, unhandleable exceptions. And then this is the success scenario where it completed the work. Okay, so that basically wraps up the top five and the bonus item. Hope everyone's enjoyed that. Thanks for watching.